Yo, what's up, everybody? Your screen all fogged up. Camera all fogged up. Hold on a second now. Dang, it's, you know it's humid here. What's up, everybody? Hold on. Give me one second here. Man. LOL. Okay, so... Yeah, you know it's humid in Appalachistan when the screen fogs up right away at the very start. Sorry about that, folks. <laughs> wow, embarrassing. Okay, what's up, y'all? <laughs> Shouts out to everybody out there. Shouts out to all my friends. Yeah, you know it's springtime, and you know it's going to get hot and steamy in here today, folks, because we're doing Romeo and Juliet, so I guess it's appropriate, right? Uh, <laughs> okay, so tonight we're going to be covering... Um, Romeo and Juliet, William Shakespeare's 1595 play, Romeo and Juliet. And um, there's a whole lot to cover here. This is a, I know this play well. Um, I've I've read this play, I don't know how many times, a lot of times. Uh, I was in this play. I played Romeo in an off, 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 off Broadway production uh, way back when. And um, I, I don't know. I I know this this play pretty well, but it's a daunting play. It's a it's a daunting play uh, to cover. And of course, we've done Shakespeare um, here before. We started off this channel with Macbeth, my favorite play, and this one's going to be a little bit different. There 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 are similarities, believe it or not, between Macbeth even and Romeo and Juliet. Macbeth is a later play uh, than Romeo and Juliet, of course, and Romeo and Juliet is really Shakespeare's um, first play that really made him that really propelled him and sort of um gave gave him um, a truly unique voice he had uh produced he had written um produced and even performed in a number of plays that are still well known still in the canon um and uh including um Henry the 4th uh and you know a, a, a bunch of other ones but of course this is our um this is the start of 1595 was a pretty productive year for Shakespeare. Um, he he wrote uh, in Romeo and Juliet, a Midsummer Night's Dream, and one other one in 1595. I can't remember which one. Um, maybe Richard II. Uh, but it's interesting that all three plays are of a different genre. So what we're going to do is we're going to go um, into, first of all, we're going to talk about uh, what Romeo and Juli Juliet is um, in terms of its structure, in terms of how we know it as a play. Um we're going to talk about what it's come to be, uh, how it's affected, um, how it's affected a number of things, including including um, our meaning people's um, concept of love, especially in terms of um, culture and literature. And we're going to what we're really going to do, though, is we're going to deep dive into the text and talk about form, content and meaning. And we're going to talk about some of the uh, deeper themes within the play. Um, I think it was, there's so much to this play. Remember Macbeth is, um, Shakespeare's shortest play. So it, it, this is a different kind of play. So it's, it's thicker. Uh, there's a lot more to it. And, and it, in a way though, it's more simplistic. Um, so we're going to talk about some of the typical, uh, ab academic themes that are, are usually used or covered in an analysis. But what we're really going to do is deep dive and try to decode some of the more esoteric and occult symbolism in the play, including, of course, not um, Gnostic themes within the play, the play structure and its origins. Uh, we're going to probably find that, again, it's both not what you remember it to be and not what you thought it was. Um, we're going to, again, um, I'm going to try to dispel some of the misconceptions about the basic language. And uh, we're going to read some a little bit of criticism on the play. We're going to talk about things like uh, unification of opposites, uh, the politics of power, and again, um, the sacred and the profane, which is one of the central and overarching, overriding themes uh, within the play's language. So I hope you guys, um, I hope y'all enjoy this. Um, I thought that, you know, I've been, t I've, I've actually mentioned a few times going not way back because we've only been a channel now for about two months um, that, uh, I was going to cover this, so I figured I, I I owed it to everybody to cover this. And of course, we can always dive back into Shakespeare at any time. You know, he has thirty seven plays and and so much 
so many lines of verse. There's so much rich, richness. We could we could t- take Romeo and Juliet and cover. We could spend days on just particular sections um, of this play. We could actually probably cover the o- opening um, uh, sonnet. We could cover that pretty endlessly. But we're gonna um, deep dive into some of the um, some of the themes that I think are important for uh, relevance for today, um, and also in terms of a worldview. And for uh, the play's own, I don't want to say Shakespeare's, but the play's own um, discussions of religion and um, really a a sort of all-encompassing worldview. So let's get started, I guess. Um, we're going to get started by uh, looking at the opening, at the prologue, really, to the, to the play and to some of its basic structure. And um, of course, before I do that, uh, thank you to everybody who's here. Thanks to all my homies. Of course, thank you to Jeff. Um, thank you to TGF, the Green Feathers, Thomas Henderson, um, beautiful Ellie, and all my friends out there. I really appreciate you. And of course, look at the links in the chat that the wonderful mods are dropping. And um, if you if you can, if you're able, or if you want to, um, think about supporting me. I really appreciate it. And speaking of which, I want to give a special shout out to all my homies who um, gave me big time support in the last stream. And uh, in the Lord of the Flies stream, go go check that out if you haven't had a chance. Um, and especially to, of course, to um, Church of the Eternal Logos again, and to Jay for um, at Jay's analysis um, for boosting the channel and and spreading it and um, sharing it across platforms. I really appreciate that. But again, thank you to Nick at the Green Feathers. I appreciate you so much, homeboy, for giving me such big support. Thank you to Stephen Thomas Tenderson. Ellie, um, thank you to everybody. Kristen, um, thank you to a devotion. Jerry at um, Exposing School Based Homeschool Mom. Thank you to all my friends out there. And uh, so much. I really appreciate it. And everybody who supported me um, because, uh, you know, you guys really made a difference. So I really appreciate it. We're going to keep going. Thank you to Natesky, the Kang, the OG mod of everyone. Thank you to OK. Um, so let's get going, you guys. Um, first of all, everybody knows I'm going to speak to you guys. Of course, I've got a high IQ audience here. So I'm going to speak to you um, as a writer would, which is to uh, write for yourself at your best. So I'm going to speak to my high IQ audience here like I'm uh, the dogs over here looking at me, by the way. <laughs> I wish I could show her, but she's <laughs> she's got her eyes locked on me. Um, so, so <clears throat> yeah, I'm going to speak to you like. Like as if you know the play, as if you know Romeo and Juliet, everybody pretty much knows Romeo and Juliet. We all know the plot and the structure. Um, But of course, I'm going to dive into some things. Um, Again, I'm not here to teach anybody. I'm not here to, to, to teach you. I'm just, I think it's just, it's good and sweet and right um, and uh, informative to um, do this analysis together. So first of all, um, Romeo and Juliet, uh, 1595, William Shakespeare, the play, it's obviously like all of Shakespeare's plays, a verse play. I'm just going to refresh, refresh all of us a little bit. Um, it's a verse play, standard iambic pentameter, and in fact, form and content play a, I don't want to say a more important role in this play, but they are central to the meaning of the play because we have the unification um, or the symbiosis or the synthesis of form and content Unlike uh, many of Shakespeare's other plays, and really unlike um, any any other play, pro- possibly before this, um, Romeo and Juliet is probably the it's pro- it's probably Shakespeare's most well known play, um, and it may be the most famous play of all time. Um, take that into consideration. It has thoroughly permeated and affected the way that really the way that. Many people live their lives, their daily lives in un, in an unknown, in a way that's unknown to them um, that they may not even understand. And so we're going to discuss some of those elements. Um, the opening of the play is unique, of this play is unique because, um, first of all, this is not, it is an original play in terms of uh, Shakespeare's composition, but Romeo and Juliet is not an original idea. And like um, Shakespeare um, is known for having lifted 
uh, ideas completely from other writers. Um, and that's fine with credit and that's fine. Um, uh, this, this, there was a play called, uh, Romeo and Juliet and it's sort of a, it was sort of a trope in terms of Petrarch in Italy. Petrarch, um, you may not know this Petrarch, um, is a sort of a contemporary of Shakespeare. And they're really, when we talk about verse, uh, Renaissance verse, um, especially 16th and 17th century verse, we talk about, um, two writers, really, uh, Petrarch who wrote the um, came up with the Petrarchan sonnet and Shakespeare who has the Shakespearean or Elizabethan sonnet. Petrarch is the Petrarchan or the Italian sonnet. Both. Of, what does that mean? We, well, we've talked about sonnets before and what is a sonnet? Let me crack this bang again. Y'all I got my, I got my AJ Coke U10. Cause I, you know, we got to get it going here uh, for this Romeo and Juliet stream. Y'all man, that is good. Tastes like American ingenuity. I'm telling you. Interesting, we're going to uh, use some American ingenuity to analyze this damn Brits play, you guys. And also, by the way, I have my, this is my old uh, ninth grade copy of Romeo and Juliet. And it's a Folger, li Folger Shakespeare Library copy. And um, it's not one of the, you know, it's not one of the copies that boomers continually criticize, um, which is where it has the translation on the opposite side of the page. It's not one of those. So don't get mad at me. Um, uh, it is, um, it is the text on the right hand side of the page and on the left side, they have sort of etymology and notes, which yet is still helpful to me, even, um, as a grown ass man who's read this play a million times and who's been in this play. And I've had so many copies of this play and I always choose to go back to this one because it's just an easy, it's an easier, you know, it's pocket size. You can fit it in your pocket. And um, it's got some good notes and some good essays. And in fact, I still have, I don't know if you can see this, but I still have my ninth grade uh, pasted in note here of the Shakespearean can uh, canon with my um, teacher's notes at the bottom, if you can see that. And in, um, in ninth grade, uh, the first thing that we had to do was memorize the entire Shakespearean canon um, in order by year. And then we had a uh, we would have pop quizzes on um, characters in plays that we had not read. So we had to sort of decipher um, the text, a random piece of text, and then determine who was speaking to whom and um, what was the play. And that sounds ridiculous and like it would be impossible, but actually it's it's not. Um, and that that really sort of got me going um, in terms of my like interest in Shakespeare and like inf informed me um, in terms of Shakespearean verse. So um, we begin the play with a, oh, oh, I forgot to mention the idea of Roman Juliet is also mythic. I mean, we go back to, we go back to uh, Pyramus and Thisbe um, and then a number of the Greek myths um, mirror the idea of the sort of spurned lovers or the lovers from two opposite sides who cannot uh, come together. And we're going to see actually how, um, Shakespeare turned this on its head and made it something completely new and original. Um, the idea, first of all, um, the, the play, the play is called the tragedy of Romeo and Juliet. So let's, let's first, okay. So before I, before I dive into the text, let's first dispel one myth, um, about Romeo and Juliet. So the play is, a, is called the tragedy of Romeo and Juliet, right? However, it is not really a tragedy. Do you know why? I mean, it's pretty, it's pretty understandable. And that is because the, the concept of tragedy, the Aristotelian concept of tragedy has a, has a number of factors, but one is that we have tragic heroes. Okay. Or we have a, tra a tragic hero, a tragic hero consists usually, especially in, in, in Greek drama and in much of remember Shakespeare has four major tragedies. Okay. Um, King Lear, Macbeth, uh, uh, Othello, and Hamlet. Um, and in each of those, we have a central protagonist, a, a title character, a major character who is who falls from a high place to a low place. Um, the place to which he falls must be exile or death. Um, now, we do have characters who fall to a low place, right? They fall into death. However, their death... And the reasons for their death and what drives their death is totally different 
than in the four major tragedies. So this is sometimes called a lesser tragedy by some scholars. It's also called a tragic comedy or a romance. Now, again, here's another misconception. The And we've talked about this in the romantic poetry um, streams. I've got a playlist of romantic, uh, romantic era literature. Um, I'll just cover this again, that one of the ideas when people think of romantic literature, and this is okay in terms of the connotation now, because connotation changes, right? Um, they, they consider that, when people think of, let's say if they're looking back and they're talking about medieval or Renaissance era romantic literature, they their idea is that they are talking about Romeo and Juliet because it's romantic because it's love. However, that's not ro what romantic means. Uh, romantic literature really in its truest form is harking back to um, the to ancient Greece and Rome, the classical era, and it is specifically Romanesque. Now, that literally occurs uh, in the play because, first of all, it's set in Italy. It's not set in Rome, but it is set in Italy. And one of the title characters is Romeo, right? Um, although Romeo's name, specifically the etymology of Romeo's name, deals with the idea of a pilgrim, somebody who goes to Rome uh, uh, in a Christian pilgrimage, obviously. Um, Juliet is also hearkening back to Rome. Why? This is pretty obvious. Because Juliet is the young and formal, uh, young, young informal name um, stemming from Julia, stemming from Julius, as in Julius Caesar. So we're, again, those two things mimic, um, mimic uh, the Romanesque ideals. Now, um, this is not tragic in the sense that we learn from the very beginning of the play from the opening uh, prologue, from the opening sonnet, that the characters are going to die. That, that right there flips the Aristotelian idea of a tragedy on its head because we have, basically we have um, dramatic irony. We, the audience, know that no matter what happens, the characters are going to die. I've talked about this before, like, you know, in relation to something like Titanic as a great example of dramatic irony. When we're watching Titanic, um, we're, we're basically asked, to, I'm not saying Titanic is comparable to Romeo and Juliet, even though there are two sort of sort of Romeo and Juliet as characters in the movie because they come from opposite sides of life and all that stuff. But what I mean is that no matter what happens, we're asked to go on this on this uh, journey um, and we know that the Titanic is going to sink. Right. No matter what. The same happens with Romeo and Juliet. Also, the play is actually a classical comedy in a number of ways. Comedy, here's another thing we're going to dispel. Comedy is not um, funny. It's not like how we think of comedy now. Comedy, you know, when you think of the connotation, what really what comedy has become. I mean, and that's that's cool. But um, the classical idea of comedy is one which in which we have ironic situations um, and possibly... Uh, situations that could culminate in death and tragedy, but they end happily. That's a comedy, a happy ending. And actually, if you if you consider Romeo and Juliet, remember that the beginning of the play, we know they're going to die, but we also know at the end of the play, right, that there is a happy ending. Why is there a happy happy ending? Because the Rom uh, the Montagues and the Capulets come back together. They end their civil strife. They, uh, they are unified and there is peace. So even though we have the loss of these two individual characters, we have peace in the land, right? We have peace in, in the family. We have no more bloodshed and violence. Um, and so that makes it a, a sort of a comedy. So you could call this a tragic comedy or a romance or a lesser tragedy. Um, so with that in mind, Let's begin by looking at the actual text. And um, it's interesting going back to this, this play because I still have my ninth grade um, close reading uh, explication um, notes. And they're pretty, they're, they're not bad. They're not bad for like a ninth grader reading the play for the first time. Um, in this one, on this first page, for instance, I have I've mapped out uh, unstressed and stressed syllables, the difference between Petrarchan and Shakespearean. Um, between between the Shakespearean and uh, the Shakespeare uh, Petrarchan and Shakespearean sonnet and its construction. 
So let's begin with this um, opening prologue. Enter chorus. So right there we have the Greek idea of the chorus. And the chorus says, it's very famous, two households, both alike in dignity, in fair Verona, where we lay our scene, from ancient grudge break to new mutiny, where civil blood makes civil hands unclean. From forth the fatal loins of these two foes, a pair of star-crossed lovers take their life, whose misadventured piteous overthrows doth with their death bury their parents' strife, the fearful passage of their death-marked love, and the continuance of their parents' rage, which but their children's end naught could remove, is now the two hours' traffic of our stage. The which, if you with patient ears attend, what here shall miss, our toil shall strive to mend. Okay, so, um, by the way, one of the, I'll share with you a little thing from drama school and a little secret of actors. I didn't, I wasn't acting right there. I was just reading the text. But um, one thing that the great speakers of Shakespearean verse, the Shakespeare's do, little trick, is to end the line on an up note. Don't end the line on a down note. Don't end the opening monologue, the opening soliloquy, the opening sonnet, the prologue with what here shall miss our toil shall strive to mend. Don't do it like that. Shall strive to mend because the mending is positive. Say it up. Also, remember that Shakespeare gives us stage directions in the construction of his verse. He tells us what to do, how to do it, how to say things, and where to do it. The reason for that is, obviously, that Shakespeare's play is in iambic pentameter. Iambic means, essentially, that the syllables are in an unstressed, stressed pattern. Um, the pentameter, penta meter, penta for five meter is the length of a line of verse. And th- it means five, not because there are five syllables, but because there are five poetic feet. Okay, so if we have five poetic feet and we have two syllables per foot because it's iambic and an iam is unstressed, stressed, five times two is 10, right? Or 10 divided by two is five penta. Now we can always flip the rhythm, right? The iambic rhythm and turn it into something like trochaic. That's what Shakespeare does purposefully with Macbeth, for instance, with the weird sisters, the witches, they speak in a trochaic rhythm because they invert everything. Remember that they are witches. So they want to invert uh, God's order. They want to turn everything upside down. They're evil. They're twisted. So they flip everything. This is kind of like the Crowleyan idea of backmasking or talking backwards. But here in Romeo and Juliet, we have what's what is sort of an esoteric concept of the perfect form of the world. We have unstressed stress because we have down up, down up, down up, right? What goes up must come down. Waves, up and down. EKG, heart meter, up and down, up and down. Life, up and down. So this will tie in later with the some of the Gnostic concepts within the play um, and some of the idea of the unification of opposites. Um, but let's look at the the introduction here. Um, first of all, we know right away that we have two families and we have two households. These are two Italian families. They are, we know that they are households. They're not actually houses. Okay. And what does that mean? Well, it means that <clears throat> remember that there is a prince within the play who uh, he's a Royal, but Romeo and Juliet actually aren't nobles dispelling again, one of the tragic concepts of the play because one has to be high born important right for it to be a true greek tragedy and this is not now that doesn't mean that they're commoners these people are um i mean my interpretation of the play is that we have two families two households who are both powerful they both run the city um this is why shakespeare always works um you can pick an era and you can place the entire play within that era. That's why I like West Side Story, even though I hate West Side Story, obviously. But uh, West Side, that's why West Side Story works. That's why like the mafia concept of Romeo and Juliet works, because you have two competing families, right? They are not royal houses. They are households. In fair Verona, where we lay our scene, he's talking directly to us, the audience or the reader. From ancient grudge, 
break to new mutiny. In other words, these families have hated each other for a long time. Mutiny because they are right. They are they they are back at it again. Um, where civil blood makes civil hands unclean. By the way, do you get the the pun and the little twist there? Because they're actually not being civil. They are civil in terms of civitas, in terms of they are they're civilians, right? They are members of the city, um, and they are well to do, but they make hands unclean. The, the entire idea of hands being unclean will play a part in one of the most famous scenes in the entire play, right? Palm to palm is holy palmers kiss, their hands touch. From fourth, the fatal loins. Now, why loins? Because we know right away that these two characters are going to be joined in erotic love. This, again, is one of the things that made this play unique. Um, because before this play, um, the, the idea of a plot involving lovers who come into various misadventures um, was totally comedic. It was not seen as serious and it certainly wasn't seen as tragic. So Shakespeare takes this and he makes it something new. He actually brings down the idea of, of tragedy and brings it to a more uh, a, a person to person level. And the, the fact that we have two young lovers means that sort of everybody watching the play or reading the play can relate to this in some way. Um, they, the fatal loins um, it also from forth, the fatal loins uh, makes me, it makes us think that what's produced from loins, well, children, right? But what is the child of Romeo and Juliet? Well, their child is death. And this is one of the really brilliant things about this play is that it crosses over love from ideal love, spiritual love to erotic love, um, which is really, this is like the example that we still see today played in, I mean, watch a movie today, right? And this is it. Yes. Um, also the, the, from forth, the fatal loins, um, uh, is it also, there's a, okay. I don't know how to say this. Um, but the thing that is produced, I'm trying to, I'm trying to be clean here, folks. The thing that happens when Romeo and Juliet gets, I know I'm dealing with grown, grown ass people here, but I'm still, I'm trying to be, trying to be appropriate here. Um, the thing that happens when two lovers come together, um, in French, for example, um, is called Le, te, le Petit Mot, right? The Little Death. And that is the, the big O is the Little Death. And Shakespeare takes that and, he, and he, he crosses over erotic love into what Harold Bloom called the shadow of death. And that, the act, right, is really what propels the two of them to their eventual end. He says... Um, Who's misadventure? We just use the word misadventure. Misadventured, piteous overthrows. I love the fact that you know he basically uses two adjectives there. They're overthrows, right? Why are they overthrows? Well, because they are overthrowing the natural order of things in terms of both drama itself on a meta level and and um, what happens in the play. Doth with their death bury their parents' strife. So we know from the very beginning no matter what happens, that these two people are going to die, but that their parents and their households will be unified um, and they will find peace in their death and the continuance of their parents' rage, which but their children's end naught could remove. Now, this brings uh, up one of the other major themes in the play, which is continuously addressed, especially in the subtext, and that is fate versus free will. What is it that propels Romeo and Juliet to their eventual end? What are the seismic forces that force this thing to happen? Is it, do they have agency in this? Or, and I'm not questioning myself, I'm saying one would question, right? Um, whether they are a product of something that's been going on before they were born, a kind of uh, inherited uh, generational sin and strife, right? Versus whether they themselves make it happen and, or they're just the, the peak. And I would say that 
um, we're going to find that, of course, they have agency. Of course, they have free will. Free will exists already going and prepared and propelled, but that is forces the eventual end. They take, they take an active agency in what they're doing. They have free will and they make this happen for themselves. Um, is now the two hours traffic of our stage. People watching this. Oh, good. It's only going to be two hours. Thank goodness. Right. <laughs> um, to which if you with patient ears attend, but here shall miss here, right. The pun here, here and here, right. Um, our toil shall strive to mend, right? The mending, the mending because of the brokenness of their families, the mending because of the unification, right? Um, (laughs) yes, yes. I'm BLA. I'm not the other thing. (laughs) Okay. Um, right. We got an algo to deal with. Uh, okay. So I love you guys. All right. So, um, Blah, blah, blah. Greta says, blah, blah, blah. Right? You you fool us with your empty words and your promises. Blah, blah, blah. And uh, Jeff, by the way, I haven't forgotten Michael McDonald. So you're going to have to bring that up. Such a long way to go. You're going to have to bring that up in a little bit. Okay. So first of all, um, the play begins with um, Romeo. And actually, it doesn't begin with Romeo. It begins with um, their friends. And their friends are battling on the streets. We have, um, we have, uh, let, let's see, we have, it kind of begins how Julius Caesar begins um, with a sort of uh, an introduction into an exposition of what uh, to set the scene. And then we have the prince giving a speech to them, telling them, yo, wise up. Then we have Benvolio talking to uh, Lady Montague and Montague, who are the, the matriarch and the patriarch of the Montague family, Romeo, Montague, Le- uh, Juliet, Capulet. Right. So there's kind of a there's a little bit of a rhyme going on there. Right. Um, Benvolio. I played ben, Benvolio as well in a production uh, Benvolio. Right. Uh, a well wisher, um, good speaker, good sayer is Romeo's friend. And he says, Madam, an hour before the worshipped sun peered forth the golden window of the east. Ooh, illuminate confirm you guys. Right. The worshipped sun. S.U.N. The golden window of the east, a troubled mind drove me to walk abroad where underneath the grove of sycamore, the westward rooteth from this city side. So early walking, did I see your son towards him? I made, but he was ware of me and stolen to the covert of the wood. I measuring his affections by my own, which then most sought where most might not be found being one too many by my weary self, self, Self versus family, self versus others, uh, individualism versus um, versus group or collective plays an important role in this play. Pursued my humor, not pursuing his, and gladly shunned, who gladly fret, fled from thee. Montague says, many a morning hath he there been with tears, augmenting the fresh morning's dew. Romeo is crying. Why is Romeo crying? Why is Romeo crying? Uh, Romeo is crying because... Romeo's crying because of Rosaline, right? Rosaline is she, is Romeo's ex, right? That has denied him, right? He's thirsty. And um, Rosaline, as in Rose line, as in the Rosicrucian uh, alchemical process that plays, that may sound crazy, but is clear in the subtext because when we talk about alchemy, Right, we and we talk about some of these esoteric ideas. We are inherently discussing unification of opposites towards some sort of illuminated golden truth. Just like we're going to have two families who are mended, and we're going to have two people, two sides who are unified first in sex, love, and death. Right, and that their family can transcend, or the two of them can transcend together. Um, also, and of course, this is, I'm discussing this in terms of an, an analysis. This is not what I believe, obviously. Um, but we have the, this play really, um, goes into the platonic idea of opposites. And what does that mean? This is kind of this, um, CJ's analysis, by the way, for all things Plato, obviously. Um, but just on a basic level, right. What we're talking about here is the idea of, um, we have 
we have two people, right? Romeo and Juliet, who prior to their birth, in terms of the platonic, the neo and the neoplatonic and the the uh, alchemical sort of Gnostic idea ideals, um, who are before they're born are like they're like they're like they're like one soul. They're joined together, right? They're like a bubble. And then at the moment of of birth, um, they enter into a corrupt world, and so they are split apart into halves. And so in the Platonic ideal, the two halves, each of the two halves, they're they're always looking for the other half, right? And then they are supposed to, when they when they find each other, they are unified, thus making a whole in order to transcend. This is like this, you know, this is like when we discuss the demiurge and the idea of corruption um, and um, and transcending uh, into, you know, the illumination of a perfected whole. Um, so Rosaline, right? Um, Benvolio greets, greets Romeo. Good morning. Good morrow, cousin. It, Romeo says, is the day so young? Okay, so here we have a great example of we have what Shakespeare is showing us is that the characters are going to speak quickly. They're going to, they're going to, they're supposed to speak one on top of the other. It's quick witted. Now, uh, the reason, the way we can tell this is because he doesn't give us a stage direction that says the two characters speak quickly one on top of the other. What he does is he, he has a line, right? He has a 10 syllable line, which is the standard, it's the status quo, and he breaks it in half. So we have Benvolio here speaking, let's say five syllables, and we have Romeo speaking five syllables um, over here, okay? And so Benvolio speaks, then Romeo speaks. So we know that as soon as Benvolio is done, Romeo should start speaking. And what does that mean? Well, like with all things Shakespeare, there is a meaning. It's not, it's not accidental. It's not some sort of, you know, quick uh, trope or meaningless stage direction within the play. What that's showing us is that youth plays an important role in this play, obviously on the surface because we have young characters, right? But the contrast between youth and old age propels much of the of the plot because if you notice that within the play the old people are always lingering they're always taking so long and in fact friar lawrence makes a, a huge mistake right in lingering too long we have um uh, getting the the potion and then the 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 letter we have um the nurse who takes too long in consoling juliet we have um the parents who take too long listening to their kids and doing anything about it. And Friar Lawrence at one point even admonishes Romeo. You know, he says, look, man, you just got over Rosaline. You need to chill and use your faculties of reason, um, objectivity, be a little more dispassionate about things because you're a man and you've got to take, you've got to, you've got to, you still got to live your life. And Romeo you know, uh, Romeo braids him and says like, look, man, how can you do anything if you've never, how can you know what it's like if you haven't felt it, if you don't feel right. And Friar Lawrence is like, look, look, dude, just chill out. I know you're young. And that is one of the major themes in the play that propel, that propels the plot. Right. Um, let's see, we have, I'm going to go on. Romeo is lovesick and I'm going to skip to some of the past. I'm going to kind of, Obviously, I can't I can't read the entire play um, to us, and um, I'm going to pick out some of the major passages that will convey the theme, uh, some of the themes of this play. Um, Romeo, for instance, in Act One, Scene Three, he says, "Let's see, he's talking to uh, Benvolio, and he's just been with um, Mercutio, Mercutio, right for Mer Mercurial, and he says, Romeo says, when the devout, this is Act One, Scene." Uh, is this scene three? Scene, yeah, scene, oh, it's the end of scene two. Act one, scene two, uh, lines like 95 through 100. He says, when the devout religion of mine eye maintains such falsehood, then turn tears to fire. And these who often drowned could never die. Transparent heretics be burnt for liars. One fairer than my love, the all-seeing sun Ne'er saw her match since first the world begun. Hello? Illuminate confirm. Notice that, of course, he rhymes there. Now, 
I didn't mention that the opening the opening sequence of the play is a sonnet. I did mention that, but I didn't discuss really what that means. And a sonnet, especially this opening sonnet, is a perfect sonnet. It's um, a Shakespearean or Elizabethan sonnet. And what that consists of is 14 lines of iambic pentameter. We have broken into three quatrains and a couplet. Quatrain means four, so there's four lines. So if we have 14 lines, then we have a section of four lines. Then we have another four lines, that's eight lines. Then we have another four lines, that's 12 lines. And then we have what's called a couplet, two lines. And the rhyme scheme is A, B, A, B, C, D, C, D, E, F, E, F, G, G. And again, I've discussed this before, but what that means is that in the, the form and the content work together to produce meaning. We have Romeo here. We have Juliet here. We have one person. We have another person, right? That's the first quatrain. Then we have um, he sees her. She sees him. Uh, he talks to her. She talks to him. That's the second quatrain. Then we have he approaches her, right? She approaches him. They go out together. They talk and have fun. And then the unification is the couplet with the rhyming lines, which forms a, a unified uh, a unified couplet or two lines rhyming with each other or two people united. They are in union, right? Here we have um, we have the end of this little of this little bit by Romeo rhymes, the all-seeing sun ne'er saw her match since first the world begun. Right? The sun and the moon. Yes. Um, remember, arise, fair sun, and kill the envious moon who's already sick and pale with grief, that thou her maid art far more fair than she. Right? In fact, it gets inverted because um, later Romeo says, and Juliet is the sun, right? Even though we think of Romeo as the sun, he's literally the sun. He's the S-O-N. And Juliet would be the moon, the Artemis character in this. She's pure, right? She's um, She stands on her balcony in the moonlight. Yes, at night, looking over her bower, like her sylvan scene, her her Diana, wood, her wood, the wood. Right, the forest. Um, let's see. Moving on to um, a very famous scene where we have heroic couplets. What is a heroic couplet? Uh, I thought moon was moon. Yes, moon is the moon. Crispy says the memmy hurt. <sighs> cool your jets, Romeo. Hell yeah. Oh, little pun there, right? Right? Cool your jets, Romeo. Nice one, Chris. West Side Story. All right. Heroic couplets. Oh, she doth teach the torches to burn bright. It seems she hangs upon the cheek of night as a rich jewel in an Ethiop's ear. Beauty too rich for use, for earth too dear. So shows a snowy dove trooping with crows as yonder lady or her fellow shows. The measure done, the measure done is a, a sort of a triple pun, a measure because um, he's measuring, he's measuring his distance to her physically. It's also a measure in terms of the meter of the line. It's also a measure in terms of a common expression, a Renaissance common expression for a dance, a phrase in dance because they are um, at the ball, right? Um Let's see. I'll watch her place of stand and touching hers make blessed my rude hand till my heart did my heart love till now for swear its sight for I ne'er saw true beauty till this night. He sees Juliet at night. Yes. She is the moon Artemis character. And we have heroic couplets. Heroic couplets is simply the name for pentameter. Uh, then Tybalt comes in, right? The Prince of Cats. Um, uh, and Capulet, who Capulet is Juliet's dad. And Capulet, uh-oh, we're kind of redlining here. Hopefully we, hopefully our voice is still good. Are we still good, you guys? We're like, hopefully we're not roboting too bad. Uh, looked like I froze for a second. I should be back. Okay, I'm going to keep rolling, you guys. Let me know in the chat if I'm still rolling. Um Capulet is a kind of a demiurge figure here. Thank you, Natsuki. Appreciate you. Thank you, slow boy. Whiteboard. 
Shouts out to Kristen, who has been killing it on her channel. Um, keep keep on keep on rolling with the hits. We love it. Love your channel, Slow Boy Whiteboard. Everybody subscribe to Slow Boy Whiteboard. Our home girl, she um, puts great content on her channel that we continuously cover. So that's awesome. Thank you, thank you, beautiful Ellie. I appreciate you. So <laughs> Slow Boy is indeed a she. <laughs> um, so let's see. Uh, what was I saying? Um, Capulet is a demiurge figure in this because. He is the patriarch of the family, and he is seen as the cruel. He's he's seen as the as the cruel overlord of their family, right? He says, "Content thee, gentle cause, to Tibble at the party. Let him alone. He bears him like a poorly gentleman, and to say Verona brags of him to be a virtuous and well governed youth. I would not, for the wealth of all this town here in my house, do him disparagement. Therefore, be patient. Take no note of him." It is my will, the which, if thou respect, show a fair presence and put off these frowns and ill-beseeming semblance for a feast. Tybalt says, it fits when such a villain is a guest. I'll not endure him because, remember, Romeo and his friends have snuck into, remember, remember, come and crush a cup of wine, right? Capulets are having this big uh, eyes wide shut party, a true uh, Viennese masked ball, right, at their house. It's going to be wild and totally depraved and degenerate, like a like a Bacchic or a, a, a ORGY. And Romeo and his friends, led by Mercutio, right, Mercury, uh, with uh, swiftness of foot, steal into the um, ROTHS uh, CHILD esque palace and put on their masks, hide their identity. Tybalt, though, sees through this mask, and he says, I'm going gonna, I'm, I'm gonna to smoke this guy, right? And Capulet says, chill. This is my home. You're not going to do this here, right? Um, Capulet says, he shall be endured. What, Goodman boy? I say he shall go to. Am I the master here or you go to? You'll not endure him. God shall mend my soul, he says. You'll make a mutiny among my guests. Remember mutiny in the in the opening um, in the opening stanza. You will set cock a hoop. You'll be the man. Why, Uncle Tis a shame. Go to, go to. You are a saucy boy. <laughs> it's so indeed. The trick may chance to scathe you. I know what you you must contrary me. Marry tis time. Well said, my hearts. Uh, he he insults him. Right, more light, more light for shame. I'll make you quiet. Right, and he, he's. He's, he's yelling at Tybalt here, but he's also saying, keep going, keep going, keep partying. Bring the light over. Bring the light over here. I want to see this guy, right? And he's saying he's the master of the house, right? He's not going to be talked to by this, by this um, young upstart who reflects the hot blood of all the youth in this play. Um, and then here we go with Romeo. We cut to Romeo talking about... <laughs> Talking around, talking about Juliet, and he says, "Here we go, sacred and the profane, you guys. If I profane with my unworthiest hand this holy shrine, the gentle sin is this: my lips to blushing pilgrims ready stand to smooth that rough touch with a tender kiss." Now, let's talk about this for a second, okay? Because this is a lot bigger than most people understand. Everybody remembers this part. Um, at least most people remember this part when you watch the play or you watch the film. Speaking of the film, <coughs> I got to say, um, you may disagree with me. You may agree with me, but the 1995, the 1995, 96, um, Baz Luhrmann, right? He's Baz Luhrmann. That's an English accent. Forgive me. But Baz Luhrmann and his William Shakespeare's Romeo and Juliet to me is a wonderful movie. I love that movie. Um, I think that Claire Danes is miscast in it. Um, but I think that uh, it's got a great cast. Remember, um, uh, what's his name? Uh, Paul Sorvino plays Capulet. Um, Brian Dennehy uh, plays Montague. Lady Capulet is played by uh, Diane Venora, remember, who plays the wife of Al Pacino in Heat, same actress. These are great theater actors. Um, these are giants. Uh, Diane Venora especially is really good. She has such a small role and she's really good. You remember, remember she's Al Pacino's, right? But you don't touch my motherfucking TV. Remember? Um, I'm sorry, Diane, if the chicken got 
overcooked. You remember that scene in Heat? Um, yes, and also Leo and all the guys. Um, I think Leo is great as Romeo. I really do. I think he fits the role. Um, and you know, it's it's visually it's an amazing film, and I think that the film gets the spirit of Romeo and Juliet in a number of ways. But you you can't ever, re, you know, remember uh, verse poetry is meant to be seen on the page and heard. Yes, and watching the play, the a play, a verse play, uh, especially is meant to be performed. But you can't really get it. You can't really feel it, as Romeo says until you read the words on the page. So let's talk about the subtext here. Remember, um, sacred and profane? First of all, he literally says, if I profane with my unworthiest hand, remember the idea of hands, and this is important, this holy shrine, who's the holy shrine? Well, the holy shrine is not an actual holy shrine. The holy shrine is a person. So Yes, we could chalk this up as most people do, as most people, um, as, mo as many scholars do in an analysis, that he is comparing Juliet in an allegorical sense to a holy shrine and that he is a pilgrim. But what's the implication here? The implication is that he is worshiping her, right? That she's like a goddess. She's like a pagan goddess. She's like a Diana goddess while using the language of Christianity, right? Right. This holy shrine, the gentle sin is this. There's a gentle sin? Okay, that's that's interesting. The gentle sin, obviously it's gentle because he's touching her, right? We have hand, gentle, blushing, smooth, rough, and tender kiss. Those are all expressions in four lines of verse. The My lips... Like two blushing pilgrims. Why are they blushing? They're blushing because he's blushing because of love. Because is it love? Right. Blushing because he's infatuated her with her, but also blushing because they're red. Ready stand. Standing, right. Standing, kissing their stand. Ready stand as in ready for action or as in like they're, they're waiting. They're waiting to let something in. In. To soothe that rough touch with a tender kiss. In other words, he's going to touch her and then he's going to kiss her where he touched her. Interesting. But is this profane? Well, it sounds profane. Yes. And I'm not saying, look, I'm not saying that romancing her, yes, and, and talking to her in this sort of fashion is profane because they're using the language of love. However, the profanity comes with the idea that the of the continuous the continuous comparison between the two of them as people to gods and goddesses or to holy things right um it says good pilgrim good pilgrim she calls him because he's coming to her yes like he's coming to a place to worship you do wrong your hand too much which mannerly devotion devotion right? Uh, the pilgrimage shows in this for saints have hands that pilgrims hands do touch and palm to palm is holy palmers kiss. Now that's, it is beautiful. It is unique and it's ingenious, right? But the central image here is one of pro profanation. Yes. And what, what Shakespeare is doing in his language here, and I'm not saying I'm, not talking about this as prudes, right? We're, we're talking about this deeper worldview or the imagery that we understand from the words and, and the subtext. Yes. Um, oh man, I'm blurring up again. Hopefully I'm still going you guys. Um, okay. I'm gonna keep it going for as long as possible here. Yes. Thank you to everybody who's still, uh, Rachel said, did he check super chats? No, he's slack and said TGF. Okay, uh, yes. Oh, I need to check. Okay, I'll check in just a second. Um, let's see. Romeo says, have not saints lips and holy palmers too? Aye, pilgrims, lips that they must use in prayer. Oh, then, dear saint, lips, let lips do what hands do. They pray, she tells him. Grant thou lest faith turn to despair. Juliet said, do you get out there? Their interaction here is one of, this is witty repartee. Yeah, this is... um. This is what Norm Macdonald called a uh, batonage. 
It's a great word, badinage, right? It comes from bad, it's a term that comes from badminton, which um, I learned from Norm. And it's basically the idea of, uh, this literally occurs in Henry V. Remember when Henry V, uh, ha- when, well, he's now Henry, goes and he meets Elizabeth, um, the daughter of the, of the French king, right? And they spar it out, right? Which is, which is pretty... Um, reflective of love, right? And of, we have these two kind of rivals and they're trying to one up each other, but not in a bad, not in a hurtful way. They're simply playing word games. One says something, the other has a comeback, come back, say something, come back, say something. Right. And they're sparring or they're, they're verbally sparring or they're like hitting a ball back and forth to one another. Just like in Henry V, there is a, um, a simulacrum of, the two of them falling in love by playing tennis with each other. They are, they're going back and forth. Right. Um, and this also occurs by the way, in taming of the shrew, that's how Petruchio falls in love, um, with cat. And it occurs in, um, it occurs in, uh, much ado about nothing. It's a continuous thing, um, in Shakespeare, a plot device that he uses. That's really cool. Then move not while my prayers affect, I take, he kisses her. Thus from my lips by thine, my sin is purged. Okay. So look, again, I understand the comparison between talking about her as if she is holy because she's so beautiful. And that is beautiful. Um, But what does it mean in terms of subtext and what occurs in the rest of the play? Because if this was a one-off, it wouldn't really mean, it wouldn't, it wouldn't be a theme and it wouldn't matter so much. But what occurs in the rest of the play is that this action, this action will lead to their death. It leads to their demise. So what one can't help but question whether their actions here and the words that they speak um, have an ill effect on them and propel them into something because, because of their, their, their literal profanity. Yes. Um, and their violation of the status quo. Um, let's see. Um, Romeo. Oh, here we get the, the famous. Uh, we get the famous um, speech. Romeo. Okay. Romeo. Um, after he leaves the party. Right. He says, but soft. What light through yonder window breaks. It is the east and Juliet is the sun. Arise fair sun and kill the envious moon. Who's already sick and pale with grief. That thou her maid art far more fair than she. Be not her maid since she is envious. Her best delivery is but sick and green. And none but fools do wear it. Cast it off. It is my lady. Oh, it is my love. Oh, that she knew she were. She speaks, yet she says nothing. What of that? Her eye discourses. I will answer it. I am too bold. Tis not to me she speaks. Two of the fairest stars in all the heaven, having some business, do entreat her eyes to twinkle in their spheres till they return. What if her eyes were there? They in her head. The brightness of her cheek would shame those stars as daylight doth a lamp. Her eye in heaven would through the airy region stream so bright that birds would sing and think it were not night. See how she leans her cheek upon her hand. Oh, that I were a glove upon that hand that I might touch that cheek. The glove thing, by the way, is a little, is a little nod to the fact that Shakespeare's dad was a, the Shakespeare family, Shakespeare's dad was a glove maker. And, He's, and again, we have the idea of the hand, right? We have the pure hand. And we also have, what is the subtext of, of what he just said, right? Of his, of his soliloquy there? Well, she's like a goddess and she's in the sky. She's like in the stars, right? Um, she is a star, like she's looking down from the firmament. She's godlike. And she's so bright that she illuminates him. That's what he's saying. He's saying that his passage into enlightenment, illumination, and fulfillment and fullness is the Gnostic unification with Sophia. 
you get it how she's a Sophia character, right? She is Sophia in this play. Um, she speaks. Oh, speak again, bright angel. Right? Bright angel. For thou art as glorious to this night, being over my head, as is a winged messenger of heaven unto the white upturned wondering eyes of mortals that fall back to gaze on him when he bestrides the lazy puffing clouds and sails upon the bosom of the air. That reminds me of, um, uh, there's a really, there's a, um, there's a few lines in much ado about nothing that I like. Um, who says it? It is, I forget who says it. Um, one of the characters says, um, behold, uh, the gentle wheels of Phoebus round about dapple the drowsy east with spots of gray, which is kind of a, also a reference to, it's about dawn, right? Dawn, dawn rising with, um, dawn's rosy fingers, rosy finger dawn, right? The Homeric rosy finger dawn. She's dawn. Or she's the, she's the, Sophia Luciferian bright angel illuminating him into oneness. Now we could read this in terms of a Christian paradigm, right? Where we are talking about pure love, but we can't really do that here because of the, because of the obvious profanation, because of the obvious profanity comparing one another to gods and goddesses. Juliet says, um, okay, here's where we're going to uh, really change your interpretation of Romeo and Juliet in one particular way. Juliet said, by the way, remember, whenever Shakespeare uses the word O, just the letter O as a word O, um, it is meant to it is meant to symbolize the opening of the soul. It's an O. It's an opening of the soul. Or like if it's in a tragedy, it's the yawning of the grave. Because remember that in verse, uh, the, the, the real estate in verse is expensive, meaning that every word and phrase has to matter and connect with every other word and phrase. That's the point of it being verse. Nothing is superfluous. And so when she says, oh, Romeo, Romeo, that's three O's, by the way. What is that? The subtext of that is orgasmic, right? Oh, Romeo, Romeo, wherefore art thou Romeo? Oh, Romeo, Romeo, wherefore, there's an O in that, Romeo. That's eight O's in one line. Now, let me change your interpretation. Uh, I'm sure you guys already know this, but let me change your interpretation of one of the most famous lines in Shakespeare. When Juliet says... O oh, Romeo, Romeo, wherefore art thou Romeo? Deny thy father and refuse thy name. Or if thou would be but sworn my love, I'll no longer be a Capulet. She is not saying, where are you, Romeo? Which is how most people see the line. And they assume that because she's standing on the balcony, Sophia, Artemis, Diana style, and he's looking up through the arbor at her. And we, we think, people think that she's, questioning where are you now, Romeo? Because I just saw you at the party and now you must be out there somebody and where are you? I wish you were here. That's not what she's saying. She's saying, wherefore art thou Romeo? Because wherefore means why. Do you understand? Do you get that? Do you guys understand that? What she's saying here is this is much deeper and it, it makes the line. It's, it's, this is, this is much better than the common interpretation. So what she's really saying is, Oh, Romeo, Romeo, why are you Romeo? Why do you have to be Romeo? Why can't you be John or Jim or William, right? Why do you have to be Romeo Montague? Why can't you be Romeo Smith, right? Why can't you be any other thing than Romeo Montague? That's why she says, deny thy father and refuse thy name. Change your name. Or she'll no longer be a Capulet because they can't be together because she's a Capulet and he's a Montague and their love is forbidden. Which ties into the idea in the play, one of the themes, one of the central, the meaning, the central meaning of the play of 
profane love. They are not supposed to be together. Yes, they can't be together because of civil strife. So in other words, she's saying she she's actually the she's wise here, Sophia. She's the wise character saying, why can't you be anything else? Why do you have to be Romeo? Now, that doesn't mean that it's incorrect, by the way, that we or that people think that she's saying, where are you, Romeo? Because from Romeo's distance, he may very well hear, where are you, Romeo? Which is why he comes to her and climbs up the arbor and, and joins her on the, on the balcony, right? He climbs, notice that he climbs up to her, right? He takes a stairway up to her heaven so that he can be unified with her. And then remember that it all falls apart and, she, and he falls down, making it, you know, it's a comic sequence. So in other words, Shakespeare is so brilliant because th this is what poetry is, okay? If you, if you read a line and you misread the line or you think that the line means one thing, the great poem will have anticipated that and will connect that pun or even that misreading with something else in the poem and will still present a unified meaning. That's what verse is. Prose is not like that because prose is splashed on the page and the words have to get on the page and they just have to get there. It doesn't matter what happens. They just have to be, they have to be spoken, but poems are not like that. Poems are the synthesized meaning from any situation. That's why a, the great poem is the greatest example of what could ever be said in that moment, right? Samuel Taylor Coleridge said the best words in the best order. That's what a poem is. A poem is not, it's not emotion. It's not something that like speaks necessarily to your experience. It's not your feelings. It is those things, but it's not those things. It is the best. It's the best that could ever be spoken in that moment. So when, so when we assume that that's what Juliet says, that's not to assume that it's wrong. It just means that she's wiser than that. And it means the true meaning is something a lot. It, it impacts us a lot more. Um, Juliet says, tis but thy name that is my enemy. Interesting. So here, Ju it, Juliet is amazing because she is really like, she's like a Hamlet character because she's considering, she's considering the meaning of the world and her place in it, especially her own world and their place in society. And she says, Tis but thy name that is my enemy. Tis but thy name that is my enemy. He's not her enemy, right? It's his name. Thou art thyself, though not a Montague. She questions, what's Montague? Do you remember that, um, that line in Lord of the Flies, right? Where Ralph is, is, is it Ralph or Simon who's sitting there pondering and they say, what's a face? What even is a face? Right. And here she's saying, what's Montague? What does that even mean? What does it mean? It is nor hand, nor foot, nor arm, nor face, nor any other part belonging to a man. Oh, be some other name. What's in a name? That which we call a rose by any other name, any other word would smell as sweet. So Romeo would, were he not Romeo called, retain that dear perfection which he owes without that title. Romeo, doff thy name and for thy name, which is no part of thee, take all myself. Okay, do you get the conflict here? She's saying, listen, man, Romeo, you have a name, but that's not an, you are, she's saying basically you are concrete. You're not abstract. You are, um, I get my idea or information about you from, I get it empirically, your hand, your foot, your face. Okay, but do you see the conflict? Because even though in that first scene when they met, when they met, they were talking about like, oh, here's my hand and here's your face. And if I kiss your face, right. But they, they packed it with meaning, with metaphysical meaning by saying, by talking about it in spiritual terms, in religious terms, right. Palm to palm is holy palmers kiss. So here 
She's doing the opposite. She's saying, why? It doesn't have to be like that. You're you. If you just got rid of your name, you could be any, anybody else. And then we could be together. Nice idea. But we know, and she probably knows that this is wishful thinking. Think of the irony here. Okay. Think of the great irony in this line, right? That she says a rose by any other word would smell as sweet. In other words, in other words, a rose as an object would still smell sweet. Yes. If we called it a tulip, right? If we called it a tulip, uh, a will, a delicate and wilting tulip, um, it would still be a rose, even though we called it a tulip. If we called it a thump or an oof, it would still be a it would still be a rose, right? Um, but that's not true because the name is is part of what gives it meaning, right? And the proof of this is the fact that Shakespeare wrote this and his whole life, his whole, his whole existence to us, his whole purpose is words, right? It's words. He deals in words. If words don't matter and the things, the thing itself matters, but not the word or anything that describes it, then what's the point of Shakespeare? Now, this plays into the, this plays into what I've often discussed from the beginning of this channel, which is the fact that we cannot judge a work of literature by the story of the author, right? It's not the author speaking. It's not Shakespeare speaking. These are the characters speaking. This is the best example of this. The characters are speaking something completely at odds with what Shakespeare did, right? That's the whole purpose. Um, let's see. Uh, what does my note say? Oh, yeah. Speaker versus poet. Um, let's see. Words and power and contrast. Uh, remember Gertrude Stein, the um, 20th century American expat Gertrude Stein, who is not a great writer, but who did say one important thing. Remember, she was she was like kind of the salon owner, um, uh, sort of, uh, sort of a female version of Ezra Pound in terms of a kingmaker, right. Who fostered the American expats of the lost generation. And remember what she said about writing her, this is pr pretty profound advice about writing. A rose is a rose is a rose. She said, right. So what we have to do is talk about things in concrete terms. Yes. And, and we, the, the, we, the metaphysical comes out or the metaphysical is inherent in the words. Yes. But it doesn't do any good, for instance, for a young person to write a poem about soul and love and something emotional because it will never appeal to us. It won't mean anything. They have to, they have to show instead of tell, right? It's okay, obviously to soul and love and those things exist and they, they, they matter. But I'm talking about in terms of the construction of the writing. D am I making sense, you guys? Um, let's skip to Act 2, Scene 2, um, where Romeo says, Lady, by yonder blessed moon, I vow that tips with silver all these fruit treetops. Juliet says, Oh, swear not by the moon, the inconstant moon that monthly changes in her circled orb lest that thy love prove likewise variable. Romeo says, what shall I swear by? Juliet says, do not swear at all, or if thou wilt, swear by thy gracious self, which is the God of my idolatry, and I'll believe thee. Right there is pretty much all you need to know in terms of the, 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 not, the Gnostic metaphysical ideology of the love of these two characters, right? They are treating each other like, like gods. Romeo is the Gnostic Adam and Juliet is the Gnostic Sophia. Yes, he is attaining illumination and wholeness through her. And they're talking about swearing on each other, especially the swear by thyself. This is like, remember in Hamlet, um, it's kind of the opposite actually of Hamlet because even though um, King Hamlet is also sort of a demiurge character in that play, 
Hamlet's father, the ghost of Hamlet, who, by the way, in the original, um, in the original production was played by Shakespeare himself. Um, Shakespeare may, may have played Fr Friar Lawrence, right? Um, but in that one, they say, swear by thy sword. Yes. And the sword, the overturned sword is a cross. Um, one more little scene here. Act three, scene two. Um, let's see. Act three, scene two. Um, nurse, nurse says, Romeo can though heaven cannot. Oh, Romeo, Romeo, whoever would have thought it Romeo. Juliet says, Juliet says, what devil art thou that dost torment me thus? This torture should be roared in dismal hell. Hath Romeo slain himself? Say thou by I and that bare vow, I shall poison more than the death darting eye of cockatrice. I am not I, if there be such an I, or those eyes shut that makes thee answer I, if he be slain, say I, or if not, no. Brief sounds determine my weal or woe. Brilliant, brilliant passage. We get the triple pun. I as in yes. I as in, um, I as in the I, and I as in the ego, right? And what she's saying, cockatrice, right? The serpent. Um, let's see. Yeah, this is the, this is a mythical, uh, and trice, right? So weave a circle around him thrice. Um, the weird sisters and their ideas of three. And we get sort of a, we get a sort of inversion of the Trinity here with um, poison and cursing. The nurse says, I saw the wound. I saw it with mine eyes. God saved the mark here on this manly breast, a piteous corpse, a, br a bloody piteous corpse, pale, pale as ashes, ashes, all bedaubed in blood, all in gore blood. I swooned at the sight. So remember at this part, she sees Romeo dead. Yes. And then is this, is the story to her. So she goes and she drinks the, she, uh, what does she drink? She drinks the poison that um, fakes her death. Fakes her death. He goes. He thinks she's dead. He kills himself. She kills herself. All by the way through the device of Friar Lawrence. Interesting enough, who deals in this play in you know we we think of him as a good character, but he's dealing in in subterfuge. And also remember that remember that when Romeo comes to Friar Lawrence and tells him about killing um, Tybalt. Um, Friar Lawrence does not get mad at him for killing him. He gets mad at him for acting so rashly and not calming down. Right. Uh, what do you guys say in check? Let's check. Let's check. Uh, let's check my little super chats real quick. Oh, sweet. Hey, shouts out to slow boy. I appreciate you home girl who sent $5 and she said, thanks for the shout out homie. Kristen, I appreciate you, and I shout you out anytime, all day, every day. Everybody, if you're watching this, especially later, please go to Slow Boy Whiteboard at YouTube and subscribe to Kristen's channel. She's got based content, and we love her videos. Awesome. Thank you. Also, let's see. Uh, let's see. Shouts out to Nick. Wow. Is this, is this shouts out to Nick? Shouts out to Nick at um, the Green Feathers. Everybody go to the Green Feathers. If you're watching, especially everybody here is obviously already sub, but if you're watching this later, especially, please go to the Green Feathers and sub to his channel. Based content. Thank you. Nick sends $50. Thank you so much, Nick. I love you and appreciate you, homeboy. You are amazing. Shouts out to all of my homeboys, homegirls out there. You guys rock. Listen. You guys are wonderful, and we're going to have a money bomb coming up soon, all right? Maybe I'll sing some Michael McDonald for you. Such a long way to go. Maybe you can maybe you can get me to not sing that. I don't know. Yeah, shouts out to y'all. I love you so much, and I thank you. You, you guys are the best. Uh, I appreciate you. Shouts out to everybody. I love you guys. Um, let's sort of start to wrap it up here in terms of the text. We are at... Act three, scene five, Capulet speaks. Um, let's see. That's Capulet's demiurge speech. speech. 
Uh, actually, I'm going to skip that one. And I'm going to go to, I'm going to go straight to, uh, let's see. Friar Lawrence. Okay, so what happens? Basically, let me wrap it up. Let me wrap up this the text of um, the the actual play. So obviously, yeah. So they both die, <laughs> right? Spoiler alert: <laughs> It's Romeo and Juliet. Come on, um, they both die, and then we have um, we have new peace between the between the two families. They are united in peace. Um, let me read some of. I'm going to read some notes here on Romeo and Juliet in terms of Gnosticism um, and a Gnostic um, analysis. Um, there are continuous references to, I mean, the language is specifically er um, erotic. We have continuous references to the bridal chamber. Um, the broader bridal chamber is a um, Gnostic variant of the sacred marriage, right? which we talked about at the beginning, human beings being incomplete and unified in two. Um, the, let's see. Uh, jealous Demiurge, a creator guy personified in the play by Juliet's father. Um, this little analysis says, the Demiurge claims the soul as its own, saying there are no other gods, there, thereby um, unwittingly keeping the soul from knowing its true home, the Gnostic um, pleroma or fullness. If the soul through the sacred sacred marriage should make contact with Paroma, such a union is treated by the demiurge as illegitimate and should be thwarted at all costs. Thus, we have what I would call, the th um, this writer would call the theme of the illicit sacred marriage or which Romeo and Juliet is the most famous expression. Obviously, the most famous expression of that. And we also have the idea of the illegitimate marriage. Remember, they marry in secret and neither one of them will, will accept that. Um, we've got references to Irenaeus and um, let's see the um, Gnostic Garden of Eden, Platonism. Uh, let's see. Um, Ted Hughes is Shakespeare and the Goddess of Complete, Complete Being, which I have, um, which is one of the books that really informed me in, in terms of Shakespearean analysis. Um, and we have specific um, Sophia characters mentioned, um, especially um, in Pericles and in, of course, Romeo and Juliet. Mercutio is a kind of archon in this play. We didn't really discuss. We're not really going to get into Mercutio because he sort of deserves his own analysis, especially Mercutio's um, long um, soliloquy, right? The Queen Mab speech. The Queen Mab speech is one of the most esoteric speeches in all of Shakespeare deserves its own analysis, but he sort of serves as a, um, as an archon figure in this, um, in this play. Um, let's see. Romeo has the animosity of Juliet's cousin Tybalt to contend with, but without noticing he, be he becomes like Tybalt himself. So again, um, I didn't mention this. We have the unification of opposites, sun and moon. We have two families, right? Let, uh, both alike in dignity, but they are separate. We have um, continuous day and night. Um, we have um, Romeo who tries to avoid engaging um, and being really like Mercutio and ends up um, being just like uh, Tybalt, being an agent of uh, sort of an angel of vengeance in this. Let's see. In Shakespeare, as in Gnosticism, there's often little sense of the protagonists bringing suffering on themselves by their own misdeeds. Friar Lawrence does not let, oh, we said this. Friar Lawrence does not lecture Romeo on how awful it was he killed Tybalt, but on the inappropriateness of despair and the necessity of acting from reflection rather than impulse. The awfulness is in the situation, one of undeclared war between his family and Juliet's and his own youthful nature. Likewise, Hamlet's friend Horatio gives Hamlet no lectures about the people who was killed, but merely cautions him to take care. That's very true. Um, let's see. In Shakespeare, psychic healing often comes by way of a gentle but powerful feminine presence who seems as though from heaven um, and who has suffered herself, both Juliet and Lear's daughter Cordelia, Cordelia means heart, um, have come of this aura. We have continuous references to um, free will versus um, fate, right? Oh, I'm fortune's fool, Romeo says in Act 3, Scene 1. Um, 
Give me that man that is not passion slave. We cry that we are born to this great stage of fools, Acts 4 and 6. Um, this says, this is what Shakespeare also explored, the realm of the ego's awareness that its effort is continuously in the way of itself. That is its goal of acting freely and accord with its highest aspirations. Gnostic myth has the demiurge or its son or the soul becoming aware of its ignorance and foolishness. The way forward is by idea of activation of the ego, the small center of consciousness and will and seeing of what lies beyond. And this is important because this stuff, you know, obviously JD, J. Dyer at uh, Jay's analysis and, of course, David Patrick Harry at Church of the Eternal Logos have done entire streams, you know, talking about John D and his importance in the Elizabethan court. Shakespeare certainly uh, knew of John D. They may have known each other. And this Rosicrucian, um, sort of Rosicrucian, pre free Masonic, um, post Templar, um, esoteric Gnostic occult ideology um, was certainly inherent in a lot of their uh, religious beliefs at the time. Um, you know, I mean, look at the music of the spheres, look at the ideology and the worldview espoused in a lot of these playwrights, especially Christopher Marlowe, John Webster, uh, Ben Johnson, Shakespeare himself. And that is further proof of that. One more thing I'm going to look at here is um, one more thing on Romeo and Juliet, and then we'll wrap it up, you guys. Uh, let's see. Uh, there was one more point I wanted to make. Um, oh, oh yeah, the speeding up of the action. We talked about the youth versus the old, the young versus the old in the play, and how the the original Rome, uh, Romeo and Juliet, the tragical history of Romeo and Juliet, fifteen sixty two, by Arthur Brooks, um, in his poem, is completely different from Shakespeare's Romeo and Juliet. It's completely different from Tristan and Isolde in one sense, and that is the the idea of patience and time plays no role in this play. In fact, it propels the action forward, and that is something that is, you know, I mean. The young, this is this is the perpetual difference between the young and the old, right? Speed versus patience, or a kind of a new knowledge versus a, a, a gained wisdom. And that informs the play. It pushes it forward. It makes the action all occur in a quick sequence. It doesn't take, you know, years for this to occur. Their love develops quickly and results in death. And again, we mentioned the um, Harold Bloom idea of um, the erotic in Shakespeare, in Shakespeare um, and how their, their love and especially their sexual love is tied up in catastrophe and is sort of marked by the overarching shadow of death. I mean, literally, right? Because it occurs at the beginning of the play. Um, they become a study of victimage and sacrifice, not tragedy. That ties in with what we said at the beginning, which was that this turns Greek tragedy on its head and makes their death a kind of a sacrifice. I mean, that's what we get from the beginning of the play, right? That they have a, there was a pun in one of the speeches that I just read, right? By Juliet talking about the moon and the cycles of the moon which is tied in with the idea of femininity and birth and how they don't have much time and their sexual love results in the end in this, in death. Right. And it becomes a sort of a sacrifice. It's sacrificial, right. Because, um, because of what occurs afterwards with the families, they both have to sacrifice their loved ones in order to have a, a, st a stability in their, in their political situation um, in Verona, right? So that's about it, you guys. I mean, that's all I've really, that's about all I really think we can dive into right now in terms of a um, realistic time frame with Romeo and Juliet. We could spend um, hours or days on this play, but I'm glad that we covered it. I'm glad we dove into it like we did. And in fact, I think that what we got out of this play in terms of that analysis 
is probably um, is probably maybe hopefully a lot more uh, meaningful in terms of you know understanding our worldview, understanding our sorry, understanding the worldview espoused in the play, understanding um, the religious um, allegory within the play, and really um, taking what is a typical analysis, a typical sort of surface level. A lot of times these surface level analyses of the classic works of literature are just, you know, they're surf. They think that they are going, they're diving deep, but a lot of times they aren't diving into the essential religious, um, spiritual or geopolitical uh, implications um, inherent in the, in the structure. Right. So that's about it. You guys, um, let's see. Rachel based mom says, check my super chats again. Oh, oh, snaps. Oh yes. Oh, sweet. Thank you to based mom, based homeschool mom, our based homeschool mom, Isla lab, verify, confirm who donates $10. And, uh, thank you so much, Rachel. Of course, I really appreciate it. You are awesome. You're amazing. Everybody, please, um, especially if you're watching this later, um, go to Jeffrey Bezos's site and um, get Rachel's book on occult feminism. Um, she is amazing, and she is a true scholar. She um, she is able to take a lot of information and things that we um, we in terms of our the generally accepted worldview or the generally accepted knowledge, especially of geopolitical or social movements and really dive into the history of them and their true origins. Um, so we really appreciate you, Rachel Wilson. Rachel Wilson at Based Homeschool Mom. Rachel Wilson, please buy her book. Her name's Rachel Wilson. Hope you got that, guys. <laughs> Thank you so much, Based Mom. Really appreciate really appreciate you. Um, let's see. Uh, Matthew Jeffers. Thank you. Sends five bucks and says... Um, for what are what are those books on the center shelf to the right of Morrison? Let me look real quick. Um, on the center shelf to the right of Morrison. So to your left, I assume. Are you talking about these? Let's see. Um, you want me to go through these real quick just to make sure I get them all? And donates five bucks. Thank you so much. Um, let's see. Uh, we've got No One Here Gets Out Alive by um, Jeffrey Hopkins and Danny Sugarman. You probably, y'all probably know that one, um, which is a the accepted biography of Jim, and is it really? This is what determined the the mythos surrounding Jim's death, um, and addresses some of the theories which we know are true about his actual death. Um, and he went to Washington Lee University, and then we have Danny Sugarman as the co-author. Danny Sugarman actually wrote um, book Wonderland Avenue which I have somewhere up here. Um, Wonderland Avenue. Oh, yeah, this is it. This is Danny Sugarman's book, um, Tales of Glamour and Excess. Danny Sugarman, who... Danny Sugarman is actually... If you've ever seen that movie that I hate, Almost Famous, I hate that movie. It's about what's-his-face as a young you know, reporter for Rolling Stone. Well, Danny Sugarman is the like better example of that because, because um, he was young and he followed the doors and he wrote about them for major magazines. He went on to get with Pamela Corson, Jim's um, widow after she died. And actually, this is interesting. Danny Sugarman actually went on to marry Fawn, not Fawn Leibowitz. That's Big Lebowski, right? Um, or no, Fawn, not Fawn Leibowitz. Oh, that's Fawn. Who who are the Knutsons? Remember, um, Fawn, whatever her name is, Fawn, whatever. She was one of the main um, witnesses in the in Iran Contra because she was Oliver Stone's secretary. And she, interestingly, Oliver Stone's secretary in Iran Contra was the was the wife of Danny Sugarman, who wrote the book on the doors. It's pretty interesting. Um, in the center of the shelf, let's see. Um, this is another Jim Morrison biography. This is Jim Morrison, The Lizard King. This one's The Lords and New Creatures, his book of poems. This is a book that I got when I was like 14. 
Um, yeah, I was 14 when I got this, and it's uh, 12 days on the road with Sex Pistols. Book about funk. Um, we've got a biography of Elliot Smith right here um, called The Big Nothing. It's pretty good. Um, let's see. We've got... Let's see. We've got um, Exile on Main Street about uh, the Stones. This is a good... This is a great book. Um, this is by... Robert Greenfield, um, who also wrote the biography of Timothy Leary. And this book is great. Exile on Main Street, because it's the ma- it's about the making of um, Exile on Main Street with when they rented out a villa in Nice that was a former um, uh, N-O-T-S-E-E-T-O-R-T-U-R-E facility. For the, it's a double. I'm not. I'm not going to say it because it's the double letters, right before T, and they use that as one of their horrible facilities um, in the south of France, and that that is where they specifically um, chose to record X on Main Street. Also, a tie in with the Doors. The guy who was the celeb dealer to the stars who dealt the, uh, who, deal, who dealt the um, infamous uh, pink tie heroin um, through the Corsican mob, who was an Italian count. Um, and was the became the lover of Marianne Faithful also plays a big part in this book. So it's a pretty good book. Um, then I have, uh, let's see, this is Jim Morrison's. Um, is this the first edition? I think this is a yeah. It's a first edition of um, first edition hardback of Jim Morrison's poems, Wilderness, Volume One. And then this is Volume Two. This is a paperback copy of The American Night. Got this when I was um, about. I don't know, probably 14. It's the American Night, Jim's Poems. Um, that has like LA Woman and stuff when he read them as poems. Um, the Brown Books. Brown Books. Oh, you mean you're talking about these behind me? Is that what you guys are asking? Oh, you're asking about these. I'm sorry. That makes sense because these are the nice books. <laughs> sorry, guys. Um, these are, this is an old um, first edition class, um, classic set of. Um, Harvard um, Harvard Classics and they're published by uh, P.F. Collier and Son in New York um, and they're from uh, 1881 um, and this has let's see um, let's see some of them are 1881 some of them are 19 some are published in 1917 um, and it's basically uh, Dostoyevsky, Goethe, um, let's see, Turgenev, um, Thackeray, Tolstoy, etc. And then um, I've got a bunch of I got a bunch of books down here that I have a, bu- a lot of first editions. Um, this one is a um, this is an eighteen ninety eight, obviously not first edition because Wordsworth wasn't alive, but in eighteen ninety eight edition of uh, Athenaeum Press series of the poems of Wordsworth. Um, I've got a, let's see. I've got a edition of Edgar Allan Poe down here um, with this beautiful frontispiece engraving. And this is from, let's see, this is from 1904. So again, you know, not first edition Poe, but it's a first edition of this particular book. Um, something just fell out of this. So let's open this up. Uh, oh, okay. This is a summary of facts. This just fell out of the book. It's a summary of facts known about Edgar Allan Poe by Dr. James Southall Wilson, Wilson, former Edgar Allan Poe professor of English at the University of Virginia. Um, and this is from, this was my great, this was my great grand. I think this is my great granddad's. My great granddad um, went to. Uh, he graduated from UVA when he was sixteen, um, and so this is his. This is his um, edition, and um, yeah. So yeah, just that's that's just a bunch of. It's a, it's a nice set. A nice set of books. So anyway, yeah, I hope that answered that. Sorry it took so long for me to for me to get to that. I appreciate you. And thank you for the 
five dollar donation. I really appreciate it. Um, <laughs> oh, it's Ratsky. Yes, Ratsky. Appreciate you, homeboy. Yes, center shelf. Is that what you meant right here? Did I get it right? I'm sorry. Listen, I'm slow boy. So, yeah, I really appreciate you, homeboy. Thank you so much. Shouts out to Ratsky, our homeboy Ratsky. Hey, listen, shouts out to all of our homies out there. Um, thank you so much for being here. I really appreciate it. And let's see. Hold on one second. Shouts out to. Jeff, Ratsky, Rats Platigan, Rachel Wilson, base homeschool mom, Natesky, um, Thomas Henderson, of course, our Kang here, our homeboy, Jerry, Mixky. Um, shouts out to TGF, Green Feathers, especially. Thank you. I appreciate your homeboy. Shouts out to beautiful Ellie. Thank you, everybody. Um, and I really appreciate you. And I hope you guys are having a great week. I hope you had a wonderful and blessed weekend, of course. Um, and that's about all I got, you guys. So I will see you. I'm not sure what we're going to do next. Um, I'm thinking either Br Brad Easton Ellis, uh, Lunar Park, or maybe Cormac McCarthy's Blood Meridian. I'm kind of, I kind of don't want to do Blood Meridian because um, Jay's essay on Blood Meridian is really like the the best analysis of the book. I mean, it's really, it's really, it's, it's my, I think it's his best essay. So if you go to Jay's analysis and you look up um, his Cormac McCarthy blood Meridian as Gnostic and his not his analysis of the Gnostic elements in the text. Um, but who knows? I mean, we could still do an analysis on that. If you have any ideas, um, just um, go ahead. You can, you can email me. I'm, I'm going to say this. I'm not going to put it in chat or anything, but you can email me also at mad maximalism at gmail.com with two X's one word. Mad, M-A-X-X, I-M-A-L-I-S-M, Mad Maximalism 2 X is at Gmail. Um, go ahead and send me a suggestion. Or put it, better yet, put it in the comments below after the video is over. Please, you guys, make sure that you um, thank, you know, thank you so much. And please uh, make sure you smash that like on here and continue to give me comments, any kind of comments, because it helps with the algo. And uh, we're almost at 400. Um, so... We're almost at 400 subs. We really skyrocketed, you know, thanks to you all and thanks to um, Kotel and to Jay and to all of you guys especially. So hopefully we're just going to keep going up, and um, I really appreciate y'all. So thank you, and I hope you have a wonderful night. I love y'all. Peace.